we are live. How y'all doing this morning? Doing good. See, we got, okay, we got the numbers filling up. This is always a fun part of these things. Uh, so thank you guys for those of you who are jumping in. Uh, we appreciate you being on time. We will uh, kick this thing off with some introductions while we let more people jump in. So uh, how you guys doing? My name is Marcus Hollinger. I am uh, Regis Head of Marketing. I had the distinct pleasure of writing our Unashamed Culture Bible Study. Um, I hope you guys were blessed by it. Um, I had a lot of fun writing it. And I'm so glad to our team here to be able to enter into this space where we'll get to talk a little bit more about how we flesh uh, that, this concept of engaging culture uh, with our faith out. So that's a little bit of me. I'm going to open the floor up for some of my friends and uh, colleagues here to introduce themselves as well. Uh, so Dee, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, let the people know where you're coming from. Um, what's up guys? My name is Dee Diaz and um, I work on the digital team here at Reach. Uh, so um, some of that, you know, includes digital marketing, um, distribution, that type of thing. Um, and yeah, shout out Marcus for the uh, Bible plan. I just finished it this week and it's been um, super edifying. And I think um, it's really cool to, to see some of the, um, the way that you wrote it and be like, oh man, just over my time at Reach being here three and a half years, um, being able to see so many times um, where those scriptures really informed uh how we informed our marketing campaigns, informed um, how we uh, engaged as a staff internally. Um, so yeah, really excited to, to be a part of this with you guys today. Dope, dope. Let's kick it over to my man Ace. Why don't you say what's up to the people before you get them pancakes over there? What's up, everybody? <laughs> um, it's super dope to be here, just kind of like talking about faith, culture, and just um, how we lean on our faith to inform the work we do here. I mean, it's a daily, daily ride. I love my team, love my reach record people. I love all the artists. Um, in fact, I'm actually sitting across from Colby right now who's chopping off some ramen, uh, which is, you know, it's just like, you know, just community, right? It's just about making dope stuff, impacting people, and also always leaning on, you know, um, our faith as like a guide of how we do stuff, artistically, musically, and everything. So. Um, it's an ongoing conversation. And shout out to the team for being here and uh, just having some combos. Nice. Ashley, why don't you let the people know a little bit about yourself and where you're coming from this morning? Hey, I'm Ashley. I'm on the digital team with D. Um, and I'm super excited to like get to know each other and get to know you guys on the chat. Um, and just have this like conversation with you guys about like the study and also like share our heart behind engaging with culture and creativity and hopefully like it leaves you guys feeling inspired and provoked and um i'm excited to just like chat with you all and get to know you awesome and joey mo joe malone won't you won't you introduce yourself to the people man let them know where you're coming from this morning yeah yo what's going on y'all uh my name is joe I'm on the marketing team at Reach, uh, deal a lot with just kind of general operations and merch. Uh, and I'm just really coming as a learner and with open arms. Uh, I think that's kind of like, I grew up somewhere where culture wasn't really talked about a whole lot. So in my time here in Atlanta, that's been a new experience for me. And yeah, just been learning and uh, Marcus appreciates you for writing uh, such a wonderful plan. It's uh, it's been I walked through it with a couple of friends and it's been really uh, informational. So um, yeah, just coming to kind of hang and and share what I can and learn from y'all. Dope, dope. And you know, guys, I, I do want to say like, you know, I definitely appreciate the feedback on the study, and I I, I just really want to. Uh, be sure to to point this this back to to God, you know, back to the Lord and back to the uh, the Holy Spirit, because I think that we are living at a time right now where, right, like this is where as Christians uh, we have the opportunity to represent our Lord well. I think you know we talk about these things all the time, like concepts like discernment, concepts like um, empathy, concepts like truth. 
and all these types of things. And I think if you are living in the United States, uh, particularly um, if we can, with the guidance of the Lord and with submission uh, to his spirit and being led by his word, I think we can do and see God do some, some really cool things um, if we're able to uh, enter into this process of upping our game. Um, as much as it pertains to discernment. So I really want to give that up to the Lord uh, as we enter into this space. But I, I'd love to um, just jump in this thing off, hear from you guys uh, that are here on the panel. How has your understanding, or where, where is your understanding currently, now that we've kind of gone through this study, and one of the first things that we talked about was defining what culture is. I'd like to hear from you guys, like, where is your understanding of what culture is uh, currently? Uh, I'll talk. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, the first the first uh, day, I think you just broke it down so well um, in terms of just how God is a creator and um, how he made us in his image to create as well. And so just understanding culture as the world around us and can't remember if this was on the devotional or in the um in the culture making book but just understanding like cultural artifacts and how everything that we do is a contribution to culture like everything that we create is a contribution to culture um and so i would say that my current understanding which I, before this journey i didn't see culture as that way um because i think as you mentioned we talk about culture as the culture, like it's this very broad concept, but we don't really understand it tangibly. And now I'm like, okay, this is the world in which I exist in. And it, it lives in, I think context is a really important thing as well. And just seeing like what it looks like to um, develop these artifacts that are also honoring to the Lord and that being creative and, innovating in in a way that glorifies God is a way to enact the Great Commission. Um, and I just think I'd never seen it that way before we started to have this conversation. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I, I can piggyback off of what B said. I feel like um, shaping culture is kind of like our responsibility. So it's kind of like um, everything we do, even, even especially on the music side, our music is supposed to be an offering to the Lord. At the end of the day, it's supposed to be made to be offered up. And that offering um, is, is something that, you know, it's tough. We want to cling to it. We want to we hold on to it. We want to have all these things. But you shape culture by just existing in the gifts that you're already given, right? Existing with those gifts. And then um, and using those gifts to offer something to him. And that's how you impact culture. And, and so... And I think about it from a Christian context, it's, it's, just be mindful of always contributing something great to culture. Which, what are you contributing to the culture? Because you can a lot of times complain about the culture, be disappointed by the culture, but are you contributing and helping shape in that culture with the gifts he's given you as an offering to God? And I think that's the lens I try to like look through in everything I do. I fall short, we fall short, we don't always get it right, but it's like we try to be faithful to um, just going in the right direction uh, as best we can. No, that's that's good. That's good. Thanks, Ace. Ashley, John, you know, love to hear from you guys. Where where is your understanding of what culture is and why it's important to God currently? Yeah, um, I feel like I feel like I've started to understand culture as like our experience and our like daily actions, and really just like culture is who it's it's us and what we do and how we contribute to the world. So I guess like to be more specific about that, like, uh, like it's what you're influenced by and what you're around, what you grow up, uh, doing where you are, like it all just impacts who you are. And then that, how, how you kind of process that and then put that out in the world is how you're impacting, or it's the culture that you're giving out into the world. And I think, uh, yeah, just like being in community with people and like, is fleshing that out, like it fleshes that out, um, who we're, who we're walking with, uh, and what, how we act, uh, that, that is, uh, just an example of the culture that we give off. And, um, I feel like 
I had a conversation with some friends a while back and where I've like, what I've been kind of learning is like, God is present in, in everybody. Uh, obviously like we know that, uh, we're all made in his image. Um, and that like by, by keeping ourselves in what we know or the culture that we know we're we're actually missing out on like the full character of God. And so like, I like for me lately, uh, it's just been like, how can I, how can I expose myself to different cultures? How can I like learn and listen and understand where different people are coming from? Because if one, if I do that, I'm able to like actually develop relationship with people and get to a place for them where I can, uh, share the gospel. Um, and two, it just shows me even more like just how powerful God is and how beautiful his creation is. And, um, yeah, it just gives me more appreciation for it. Oh, that's good. That's good. I hear you, you talking about once you understand that culture is something that is oftentimes sort of uh, given to us. And when we, when you have that awareness that you've been given a certain culture, it's, in, it's important to recognize that and then learn to sort of move beyond that in an effort to understand the, the larger world um, that we live in. I think that that's really cool. Joe. I appreciate you pointing that out. Ashley, how about you? What's your, what's your current understanding of culture and why it matters? Yeah, I mean, picking, picking backing off of like what everyone else has said is like amazing. And I saw someone in the chat said, culture is what we make of our world, our community and ourselves and families. Um, and I just thought that was amazing too. And to me, like culture is like the world around us and like the influence. And I think um, it's important as like Christians, like how we influence the world and people around us because that becomes part of like who we are. And I even think like, as a black female, like there are areas where like I'm impacted by black culture or influenced by that as well. Um, and it becomes like who you are and you're a part of this. And so to me, like, yeah, culture is just basically what you guys are saying, just like our influence and the world around us and how we contribute to the world. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. And I, I wanted to, to start right there because I think if you get this, if anybody can really grasp this concept, then I think you'll really get the beauty of this study and, and really what was what the what it was aimed at is this idea that culture really is about what we make of the world, right? If we can move, if we can move past this thought that there is this big sort of monolith culture out there, then we can we can become a little more effective, we can become a little more creative, we can become that much more um, attuned to what's actually going on around us. But, and we can also move beyond what is often this posture that we can take when we think about the culture is that we always have to be against it, right? We, we, we set up this divide oftentimes that something is either sacred or something is either secular and we split it right down the middle and we start to say to ourselves well how do i engage a uh, secular culture how do i engage you know the world and it and and that question well it is a good question and it is honest you know it comes from um tradition that it comes from a, a very sincere place in uh, Christian tradition and church tradition, it can be very stifling. But we'll, if we can switch, if we can really switch our lens and start to say that there are cultures, right, then we become that much more effective in how we can engage uh, not just the world, but the worlds around us. And one of my favorite authors, Andy Crouch, talks a lot about this and that, you know, to say that we want to change the world. It, it really is, it's too big of a chew, it's too wide of a lens because it's, it, it really, for any one person to think I'm gonna go and set out and change the world, uh, big picture, man, you're really, you're, you're really setting yourself up for um, to not be as effective as you, as, you, as you potentially could. But if you say, hey, I'm going to engage a particular culture 
I'm going to engage a certain group of people in a certain place. Now you're, you're, you're narrowing in, right? You're able to start to practice uh, uh, tending and retending a garden, right? Harkening back to what we see um, in Genesis. And for those of us who are on this call, um, as Reese Records have, we are particularly engaged in hip hop culture. You know, and I'll always tell folks, this is so near and dear to my heart because of primarily the way that I grew up. Um, man, hip hop taught me everything I know. Um, taught me how to walk, taught me how to talk, taught me how to dress. Um, and there are some very beautiful things about that. But obviously, uh, as a Christian and developing a Christian worldview, I had to learn sort of this skill for saying, OK, these these things that come with the culture, you know, I, I can't really continue. I can't walk with that. Right. But these other things that are that come to the culture in particular, uh, something that I love about hip hop culture is this tradition of being a voice for the voiceless. When you go back to the origins of hip hop, you know, Joe and I had a conversation about this very early on. There's a song by Grandmaster Flash, it's called The Message. And in this song, one of the very first hip hop songs, this man is describing life in the ghetto. It's broken glass everywhere. There's drug paraphernalia around and there are kids in this environment. And if you didn't, if you didn't grow up in a place like that, you would think it, it's, it's far off your radar to know about those types of things. But these brothers with this microphone and with these beats, going in there and, and, and speaking about those experiences, not only did they give voice to folks who were experiencing that, but also if you had ears to hear, right? Like if you're hearing that and you're saying, wait, broken glass everywhere, a drug paraphernalia on the streets where kids are playing, it, it can really start to pique your interest to say, hey man, there's something, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong with this picture. You know, I, I might need to apply myself uh, to go and do something about that. And so that's just where when we can start to think like that, when we can start to localize our understanding of culture, then we can start to engage with specific issues, with specific resources and find specific people uh, to partner with us in doing uh, what we what we understand and what we would like to call gospel uh, work. Uh, so that I just wanted to kind of staple that in fasten us in there um and then um yeah, yeah ace i think you got something to say yeah, to that. yeah 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 i think i think you said something really impactful that if you're carrying the burden of trying to change the world you may be biting off big a, a piece too big that you can handle right but i think even kind of in line with our mission if we can help um change the way people see the world right just helping them see the world differently that's like the, I think everybody has that option and that, and that like call to do that. You know what I'm saying? Because it reminds me like one of my favorite Bible characters is Joseph. My man was in like the world system, quote unquote, the secular system. And he's like, he was like number two in command in a, like a very worldly system, but he didn't forfeit his kingdom lens. He stayed centered, right? So he was able to change the way people saw people of God in like a world system, the way he handled himself. And I think that's such like a model for us in terms of engaging culture. And it kind of, it kind of fits the pressure, like it kind of like, like reduces the pressure of trying to change the world. It's like, that's a very individualistic savior-esque complex. Like, Yo, I'm going to do this. It's like, nah, I'm going to, like you said, tend to my gardens, impact my uh, local community and help people see that way that change different things. Absolutely not. Thank you, Ace, for, for sharing that. And I think one other thing I want to I want to comment on as we as we navigate uh, just another perspective setting piece is this idea that culture is what we make of the world. Right. And again, hearkening back to my man, Andy Crouch, I like to I like to call him Uncle Andy. Uh, and he, he seems to be OK with that. When we can start to think about culture as what we make of the world, we can we can start to see culture everywhere, right? So in his book, Culture Making, he he singles out the omelet, right? As the omelet is a piece of culture. Someone thought one day, man, I should be able to make, it should be possible for me to make a, a pocket out of an egg 
and sprinkle some of my vegetables. I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't have to break up my, my breakfast, is, it, my breakfast experience. I should be able to put it all together and get my, my protein and my vegetables and my flavor all in one. So what this person created, they made sense of the world. They looked at what wasn't there and they used what currently was there and they made a, a piece of culture, an omelet, right? Someone made a chair for us. Someone said, man, I should be a, the world is organized in such a way that I should be able to sit down from time to time. And they made a chair. And I, I, I point that out because I wanna move us away from this notion about culture and about creativity that it only pertains to the arts, right? Because a, is here with us and and um, by trade he's he's the only artist in our midst and that's important right but if we just make this 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 uh assertion that creativity and culture making is singular to the arts then we again we miss out on a lot of a lot of opportunities uh, you can make cult just like you can make culture by making an omelet right to feed someone. You can make culture by doing what someone in my neighborhood recently did. They made a, a fridge called the Free 99 fridge. And it's a it's an outdoor fridge that you can go and take food to, right? And the homeless in, in the West End, now they or, or and, and those who are affected by food insecurity, they know that you can go to these fridges and there's food available. Y'all, that is culture making. Right. So I just that's another one of those things that I wanted to bust up um, as we, uh, you know, as I was thinking about this study and as we had this conversation. But let's jump into some of the questions that we got, team, and we'll, we'll bat some of these around. So one of the first questions that we got from our um, folks on, com on, on, the, uh, on the text that we have was, how do you incorporate faith in a secular, creative work environment? I'd love to open that up to y'all. How, how are you guys thinking about this? Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that story that you just told Marcus, because I think that's so dope, like that example of culture making and understanding the world, the context and the and understanding a need and meeting that need um, by creating something uh, that way. I just think that's really cool. Um, I think for that question, um, like my my question back to the the person that was asking it is are you asking in terms of like how you can incorporate faith with your team internally or how you can incorporate faith externally and the reason that i ask is because i think sometimes like um like a big part of how to engage our faith i think comes down to understanding what our personal mission is and sometimes we think that our mission is dependent on circumstances but really our mission which i think comes through prayer and just um there's a book the gift of being yourself that talks about like um finding what you're passionate about or what what your your gifts are and then finding a need in the world and when those things collide, where that where those two things meet is how you can find um, basically your mission, which I think is a really cool way to think about it. But um, a mentor once told me like, hey, whatever your mission is, it's not dependent on what your job is. It's not dependent on what your circumstances is. You can live out your mission every single um area of your life. And so for me, that looks like, I know what my personal mission is, is part of it at least, is to help the people around me to speak life into them and um, to help them find their greatest potential, right? Like to, to help them achieve their dreams. And so obviously in the context of REACH, working with artists, um, I can, that applies in that context. But then also with my team, and the way that I see my team internally, I can see how that mission plays out um, and the way that I engage with Ashley, right? Like when we're having a conversation and I'm like, okay, well, how can I find ways to build her up? Because I know that that's something that God has called me to do regardless of my circumstances. And so I think if you're living or if you're working in a creative space that is secular, um, my thing would be 
whatever, figure out, you know, what is it that God, which I think is done through intimacy, through prayer. And sometimes you ask the people around you and they are really great. Uh, like people that are trusted, that know you, that you do life with, sometimes they can help you figure out what that mission is. But for you, figure out what that is. Cause sometimes I think we think it needs to be this great grand thing when really it's in the micro that transformation happens. And it's in the micro conversations, it's in the daily submission to our mission that we can have um, gospel impact. Yeah, I, I think that's really good, Dee. And like, as you were just kind of sharing that, I, I think I, I tend to just like, for my own, just knowing how I operate on my own, just try to simplify things down to like the smallest detail that it's like, okay, if I need to do one thing, when I engage regular culture, this is what I need to do. Um, and I feel like I, in my own mind, I've just simplified that down to just like, I need to love people well. And that's just super complex. But like, I think I just kind of like realized this when I like, when I was studying Mark, um, or yeah, when I was studying Mark, um, and in chapter 12, he just brought up like the greatest commandments and it was like, love God and love your neighbor. And like where I grew up, it was just like the commandments were like everything. It was like, follow the law. And for some reason, when I read that, it was like, okay, you just simplified down for me. Like these are the two most important things. So if you care about anything, and following my law, like do this. And so like that to me, just like gave me a lot of clarity of like, okay, like when I'm engaging people who don't know Jesus or don't know God, like the greatest thing that I can do is love them well. And that just looks like how you treat them. Um, and not as much as like, let me tell you the truth. <laughs> let me tell you what you need to know, you know? So that's how, that's, that's kind of how I've approached it. Yeah, I'm the same as Joe, like simply just like loving people in the work environment that you are in, or even if that's school or whatever it is, like, I feel like just being an example of Jesus. And I like how Portia said making Christ attractive. And that's like something that I've read is just like, you won't, you don't need to convince people to like, love Jesus, if you are him and an example of him, you can't um, prove to people with like scripture, like, oh, Jesus is so good without being an example of um, who Jesus is. And so that's just, um, just loving on people and just being in those spaces and staying true to yourself, staying true to your morals, staying true to um, who you are and having people see you, um, see Jesus through you. Sorry, I was struggling to un unmute there, but I think I think that's really good. And you guys start to draw out this concept of love, right? And I, and obviously I think we would be, we, we probably would do ourselves a, dis, a disservice if we didn't acknowledge another tension in culture engagement. And it's the tension between truth and love, right? And, and, and I, a lot of times in these conversations that comes up where if someone says, man, I just try to love people, then you can almost expect people to say, but oh man, you're not gonna, you're not giving the truth. Right. Or some people say, oh, man, I, I'm just going to tell the truth. Um, um, and, and, and then you can just expect someone to come and say, oh, but you're not being loving. And again, I think that's one of the this, in this in spaces like this, when we have the opportunity to bust up these either or dynamics that we start to see. Right. And we can stop approaching God and others uh, with these unnecessary ultimatums. And I really look at the story of the woman at the well and how Jesus approached her. And what he did, the, the entire interaction with Jesus and the woman in the well was countercultural. The fact that Jesus, right, a Jewish man, was able to travel, right? He went and met her at the well. Y'all, a man <laughs> traveled to go see a woman at a well, right? That's, that's very significant because men didn't do that at that time. And not only a woman, but a Samaritan woman. This is divinity in the flesh showing love not through pacification not through passive engagement but through action 
right? Through demonstration, he goes and he meets her there. And, and he embodies also truth in that he tells her, hey, this is who I am. If you knew about this water that I had, you, you, you wouldn't thirst again if you would drink it. He says, if you knew who I was, then you, you would be offering me water. And he, and he shares this message with her. He tells her that the kingdom of God is at hand, that her sins are forgiven after addressing her in her sin, sets her free and she goes out. I think that's an amazing picture. But one thing that we miss sometimes is we assume that our role is always Jesus in the picture, right? We never want to think that maybe we're the woman at the well needing to come and be addressed in our current um, situation or with our current perspectives. And also, we miss the opportunity to follow that model of Jesus and, and seeing that, man, this concept of love and this concept of truth is best embodied in action, actions with words that create perspective, right? So I just wanted to speak that in there, bust that up a little bit. Someone else asked us, where do y'all find your inspiration? Also, what makes you the most creative? In terms of like making music or just like? Well, just in terms of uh, cultural yeah. engagement and creativity. Oh. Obviously, Ace, you must yeah. find some inspiration in a Tesla. Uh, <laughs> but, but where hey, else? You know, right? Honestly, I, I find inspiration from just like consuming, like I'm, I'm, my heritage is, is Liberian. So that definitely helps like just pull from different cultures. And honestly, just to be blunt, I pull from like hip hop and like what's current, what's new, what's rising. Cause I'm always, I think artistically, it would be a disservice for me to steward the gift God gave me to kind of pull from from a vacuum of like Christian, quote unquote, Christian art um, or artists who are, you know, Christian, because I feel like you can take something that's dope culturally, enhance it, redeem it, and, and kind of use it as an offering, like I said earlier, to kind of offer something, you know, to the Lord, you know what I'm saying? So I would say, um, yeah, obviously. And then, and then also just, you know, also like reading, and just giving yourself a break. I've learned to just being still and being quiet in your daytime throughout the week allows your creative mind to kind of reset and not being so work driven. Like sometimes just sitting quietly on a ride to work. I'm looking at like the trees and it sounds like kind of poetic and kind of goofy, but I'm literally looking at the sky like, yo, this is a beautiful creation. Like, can you believe like somebody made this? So that those little things kind of just feed my creative spirit and just help me throughout my, um, my day. So I hope that helps. No, that's good, man. Yeah, I'm just picking back off, piggybacking off of Ace. I I feel like when I'm resting is when like I get most inspired with new ideas. Like just being out in the backyard, like working on the yard or like uh I don't know, going for a walk. It's like regrounding yourself with your life and just like appreciating it. And then it gives you that energy you need to like approach what's in front of you with uh, excitement and, uh, yeah, just the, the, just the motivation to try new things. Um, I love that you guys both touched on rest. Cause I just feel like that's so countercultural in such a hustle, 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 like hustle, uh, world. And so I just love that. Um, cause I completely agree with that. Um, something that I feel like in my, so I like to borrow from outside of our industry a lot because I think that sometimes that's where a lot of innovation comes from is not um, just studying uh, concepts outside of just music, like definitely studying within music, but also studying different genres, like what are they doing? And then also studying, you know, um, different industry, like the movie industry and studying, um, you know, like food and just different things that we don't necessarily get to engage with a lot of times because then you're able to blend and bring things together that somebody else may not have seen come together. Um, so that's just a practical thing that I like to do is to diverse, like diversify, not just the genres in which I study, but diversify the industries in which I study as well. 
Um, and then I also wanted to just address the, I think, I, I don't know if anybody's asked this, but it's just a natural thing that would um, come up as we talk about where we borrow inspiration. Um, I was on Instagram last night and um, Brooke Ligerwood did this really cool thing where she uh, posted a bunch of stories with just her favorite books that have influenced her. And at the end, she, po she posted something that I just like, I love the way that she put this. And she wrote, expect a wide variety of authors and worldviews. Reading is travel. If I know where home is and use wisdom and discernment, I can safely explore. If you don't know where home is, go careful and slow, stick to the main routes. And I think that was so key because sometimes we're, there's this fear of like, oh, don't explore too much. Like don't, don't dive into secular uh, culture. Don't, don't dive into, into secular music because that could influence you. And it's like this thing that she said um, of one, read a variety of authors and read a variety of worldviews because reading is travel. And I think it's the same with the culture that we consume. Um, and if, if, and what she said is like, just know where home is. And so I think if, and, and we know this in ourselves, right? Like if I know that I am personally seeking the Lord, that I'm in my word, that I'm seeking prayer, like I'm doing these things and I start to look into some different things and I can trust and discern and use wisdom as I try to find um, a variety of inspiration. Um, and then if I, and then, you know, like if you feel further away, maybe use wisdom and be like, hey, like right now I probably don't need to be engaging some of that stuff. Right now I need to guard my heart. Um, but I think it's so uh, wise for us to know like the context in our world and the only way that we can do that and understand the culture around us is by um, finding inspiration in a variety of sources uh, and a variety of authors, artists, whatever that may look like for you. Now that was that was great, D. I want to take that and then go into another question that we have here. Um, it's a, and this one is a little more weighty. Um, and it says here, let me find it. How can we understand Christians that embrace obvious racial and immoral political objectives? Uh, one of the things I want to say about this space and the content that you guys will get from us and the interaction that you will get from us is we never want to tell you what to think. Right. Uh, so there are some people who will take up, they pla up their platforms and they'll tell you, man, God told me to vote for this person. Right. We, we're not we're not going to do that. Uh, we're not going to be those people. You know, there are some people who who take up these platforms and in God's name say that you should do this political thing. And, and, and we're really not going to do that. But I think that that is an important question. Uh, to in some to some way try to address uh, as much as it pertains to culture. And I think what Dee was saying specifically is very important when it comes to understanding and engaging in such a politi uh, a highly politicized climate as the one that we're in right now is through the practice of trying to understand other people's cultures and understanding ourselves. I think Joe said this uh, from the beginning is it's very important for our white brothers and sisters, particularly in America, to understand that culturally you have a certain experience, right? That you have a, an experience that, that if you don't actually work against it, you don't have to consider the cultures of others. Whereas if you're African American or if you're minority, you, it is the, the dominant culture, if, if we can use that language, is pushed on you, you know, more so than your own culture. So many of us, it is Black History Month. Many of us, as Afri I think some of our white brothers and sisters would be surprised to know, a lot of us African-Americans, we don't know our history like that because it's not taught to us. We have to go through the process of downloading majority culture and then being able to regurgitate that in educational and professional environments. And there's really not a ton of time to try to understand our own culture. And it's not until uh, we become self-actualized or reach a certain place in our lives where we have time that we can go back um, and kind of dig into those things. And so I just say that to say, um, 
it's not that question can't be answered the same way for everyone. I think, again, when we understand that there are cultures, I think you have to understand the culture that you're in, understand the history of your culture. If you are a white American, it's very important for you to understand the history of white Americans in America from different perspectives and understand why some people may be at odds with some of the things that would bring you comfort, right? And as African Americans, I think we would engage that a little bit differently because there are some things culturally that have been pushed that have come at the detriment to African Americans socially, financially, economically, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so I think that that question can't necessarily be answered the same way for everyone, but I think it's important for folks to try to situate themselves and try to understand what culture am I in? What are the consequences? What is the history of my culture? And then from there, uh, be able to engage with a listening ear uh, for other cultures and try to discern, are these messages helpful for others? Are they, you know, unhelpful or detrimental to others and, and we can begin to lean on the spirit and the word um, to do that so i'd open it up for you guys to address that as well i see we're getting some comments on that one thank you marcus for sharing that perspective and i i, I just want to you know caution any commentary on this that you know the the goal with anything is to like listen and seek to understand to be heard, to be valued, and just to be appreciated, and just value people as image bearers uh, of God, first and foremost, and just acknowledge that there are different cultural backgrounds and barriers that um, influence or inform how we see other people's cultures. But um, I feel like, yeah, and, and, and something, I think our, our goal is never to try to push any kind of agenda or tell people how to react, but more so just when, when you zoom out and just acknowledge that wherever you are, you know, socially, culturally, you are, you have a culture that you're part of and how your culture that you're part of, it influences how you relate to the rest of society. And I, in speaking of engaging culture, which is kind of like the overarching theme of this conversation, um, I, I would challenge and say that even quote unquote church culture is a culture that needs engagement, that may need some redemption. So there isn't, an, there isn't any culture on this earth that's like um, uh, exempt from uh, like uh, development that's exempt from uh, being uh, transformed, re revitalized. So to assume that there's like a church culture that has a right and any pushback on that culture is a, is a pushback on Christ himself. I would just say, you know, it's Christ definitely sits on top of all cultures. And so nothing is above reproach. I think the scripture talks about that. So as we're engaging a racial conversation or just as Chris is how to engage on topics about race. It's just zooming out, acknowledging that you are part of a culture and, the, and church culture is not exempt from uh, reproach or rebuke from a godly place to all push us towards a more um, like fresher understanding of how to engage each other. Um, you know, so, and, and those, those conversations are, are going to create tension, but I have never, I have never seen transformation without tension. It is a necessary context of growth. And so where there's conversation, there can be tension. And then on the back end, prayerfully, there can be transformation and better engagement as brothers and sisters on any context, any conversation, so. Yeah, I Got think- it. It's great, it's good stuff, Ace. Yeah, I think too, I saw uh, Chaplin said, I think like really we're talking about how our experiences can affect our cultural views and impacts. And that's like, that's where my mind went with like talking about political objectives. It's like that landscape is so polarizing. Like you're if whatever side that you land on it, it just comes with so much judgment and assumption about who you are. And I think when like engaging, like how do we understand that? Uh, it's just really good to, to step back and say like, okay, first, like, let me understand why you are in that place and why you do think that way, because our life experience is so like complex and it has led us to, to where we are at the moment. 
And I think it's just so, uh, it's a disservice to just engage somebody with a, with a broad assumption about who they are because of one, one stance that they take, uh, instead of like saying like, Oh, let me, let me know your story and actually like, why, how did you start thinking that? Like, just be curious and seek to develop a relationship with that person so that you can love them well. And you guys can bounce thoughts and ideas off of each other. Um, Marcus, I even thought about like something that was super impactful uh, from the plan was like on day four, how you just kind of detailed out um, in Matt, or I think it was in, yeah, in Matthew, just like how we approach people with something that we have or a gift we have. And I thought what was really cool in that was in 24, it said, first be reconciled with your brother or sister. And I think like, I, at least for me, like when I'm reading scripture, I can kind of graze over things that I don't fully understand. And so like, I was like reconciled, like, what does that actually mean? And uh, it like, a, like in the Greek, it was like change and en enmity for a friendship. So it's like, what's enmity? And it's like the state of feeling actively opposed or hostile. And so I was like, Oh, Dak. So like when we, when we engage with people who aren't, uh, who don't think the way that we do, we need to check first if we feel uh, hostile towards them, because if we feel hostile towards them, that we're not going to be engaged, be able to engage them with the love of Jesus. And that was just like, I was just like, okay, like you want to talk about how to engage a political conversation or a racial conversation, which is so contra controversial right now. It's like, well, check yourself first, make sure you're not in like a holy, holier than thou place and engage them with love. So. That's so good, Joe. My yeah. God. Yeah, he did. And I think that that with that, what that speaks to and is some, some handlebars I think that we could throw out in this that makes that helpful is some postures right i think when we start talking about hostility and how we engage really in culture in general uh what we're talking about is this condemnation right i think as christians condemnation is a card that we often play when something doesn't seem to kind of hit all the, the christian tick marks right but we have to i think if we understand that yeah at some point condemnation is a good thing, right? You read Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, he outright condemned the passivity, right, of the, uh, the Christian leaders in the South who were writing and telling him like, hey, please stop this justice work that you're doing, right? Lovingly, he condemned them. I would recommend that every, or he condemned that, that thought. I would recommend everyone read that letter. It's a master class and how to condemn um, things with Christian love and godly uh, fervor, right? But we also have these other postures that we can take up, right? We can create, right? We can create things that help people envision um, a new future. So we don't always have to be condemning. Sometimes we can, we can create. At other times, we can cultivate. Sometimes we can cultivate uh, good things. If someone's doing something good, like we talked about, um, we talked about the free 99 fridge, man, we can cultivate those types of activities by investing in them, right? By, by spreading the word about those things, by marketing things like that, um, and so on and so forth. And sometimes we can, sometimes it's okay to copy. Sometimes we might see someone doing something good and we can, we can replicate with it what they've done. We can replicate um, the good works that other people are doing. But I think one thing that would be super helpful for us in this space is to understand that we don't always have to do any one of those things we can move fluidly through any of those things um so yeah just wanted to kind of uh throw that out there uh we got some more time i mean we got about 10 more minutes we can take some questions from folks who are coming in if you guys have been rocking with us we definitely want to find out what's important to you and honor you and your time uh for being here with us um and we got a few more questions that we can move through there's one question that we had i think is important um to, to answer someone says uh what do you consider backsliding away from god to idolize culture i'd love to hear you guys' thoughts on that that's a hard question um i think we have i thought about this on the last question i think it applies here 
Um, I think we need to stop trying to avoid the tension um, because if we're committed to this um, calling and if we're committed to being believers, we can't escape the tension. Like it's always going to be there, whether it's in this political climate that we're in or whether it's, um, you know, figuring out how to engage culture and remain submitted to the Lord. And I think um, even like how we started the whole Bible plan in Genesis, like, I mean, Adam, Adam and Eve screwed up really early on and God developed this entire plan for redemption so that um, we would be able to still spend eternity with him. And I think um, because of that, I would say don't, sometimes I think when we mess up and when we start to backslide away from God is when we start to uh, seek comfort and when we start to avoid the pain and the tension. I think that that's a really good sign for me. I know that I'm pretty in alignment with the Lord when I'm, when I'm afraid that I'm going to offend everybody around me. <laughs> like that's something that I've had to learn this last year is there's when we're when you're looking at social media and everybody's like telling you one thing and one thing and and somebody's telling you another I have to decide like I need, I want to be a person of conviction and the only way that I can do that is by um being submitted to the Lord being submitted to prayer living a life of holiness but also like like we said earlier um not disengaging from uh, hearing different perspectives, not disengaging from the people that we are called to love. Uh, and so I say all of that. Um, it's pretty simple for me, but I think remaining uh, rooted in word, scripture, um, being living a life that's submitted to the spirit, um, and then also just being okay with making mistakes. I think that Joe and Ashley and Marcus have all heard me kind of like, we'll be in the middle of a campaign. And a lot of times what I will do is I'll start to overthink it. And I'm like, you guys wait, like, we're going to offend this person. We're going to offend this person. Like, and, and I think that that's just a part of it. And thank God for my team. That's like, Hey, it's fine. This is the mission that we set out for, and we're going to do it. And so um, that's kind of my perspective. Uh, I don't know if, if, if it's on point, but I think, you know, if you're pretty uncomfortable, you, you might be, uh, you know, in the right spot. Yeah, that's dope. I, I would say, I mean, you know, I, I'd be, you know, backsliding. That's just, that's just, <laughs> that's an everyday, that's an everyday struggle. Like Jack Andy said, everyday struggle, no Joe Budden, like, but I think, um, like somebody, somebody put that in the, uh, in the comments, like the Holy Spirit, this is, this is, this is not cliche, this is the real thing. Like, honestly, we're not always going to feel, feel like doing the right thing, do, doing the right thing, uh, saying the right thing. And if I'm being honest, when I am, you know, controlled by how I feel, I generally make bad decisions. But when I yield, I, when I process how I feel and just don't just don't disregard it, but like, all right, this is how I feel. But what am I going to do with how I feel? Am I going to act out on how I feel? Or I'm going to process it and like surrender it to like some type of aligned viewpoint that is greater than me. And that is where I feel like it keeps me moving forward. Not that I'm perfect. Integrity ain't, it's not perfect. It's not perfection. It's just faithfulness to the right thing and going in the right direction. So. No, that, that's really good. I think we had another uh, specific question come up. This one was from uh, Salomon Navarro. And um, the, the question is, how do you go about handling and processing critical race theory? And I think that's a, that's a very uh, specific question. I think it's something that is definitely um, in front of us right now. And I would say, you know, part of the study, Jesus' high priestly prayer and um, John was a, a big, 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 big influence um, in this, in the way that what Jesus is posturing and what he's saying uh, and he, as he prays to the Father for his disciples, he says, Lord, sanctify them in the word. Your word is the truth, 
for I am not calling them out of the world, but just as you sent me into the world, now I send them into the world. Protect them from the evil one um, is what Jesus prays uh, for his followers. And I think when we start talking about different things, there obviously there's this energy around, you know, critical race theory, or, you know, um, you may say uh, feminism, or you may say uh, white supremacy, or any of these other uh, isms that are that are kind of going around. I think if we can be sanctified in the word, right, and and understand that God, that we, there's no dark corner that we can't turn down and not take the word of God with us to measure things out, right? Like, I'm not going to give a, a shining critique of a critical, I'm not going to give a shining, um, you know, promo uh, for critical race theory, but I think when we start to think about what we would call um, some secular mindsets, uh, we can we can think of different things like capitalism, right? That's not a a system um, that's written into the Bible, but it is a system that we that we process and deal with every day. And as Christians, we have to have we have to develop the skill, right, of using God's word and being influenced by God's word to engage our culture whether that's economic systems. And, that's, and I'm glad that you asked that question, Solomon, because when we start talking about creativity, right, we're not just talking about the arts. We're talking about the creativity to develop economic systems or economic thought processes that can help us create flourishing for other people. We can start thinking about how do we create uh, neighborhood programs. We can start thinking about how do we create small businesses, um, different things like that, uh, that help people. So any of the different theories that are floating around, man, I would just encourage us not to uh, set them up as idols and, and drink from them and let them become our gospels. But also I would say, you know, um, if someone is, is, is uh, sounding like they're influenced by those things, then uh, we can give a listening ear to find out what may be the humanizing truth behind what they're saying. So, well, guys, we're getting ready to wrap up our time. I love uh, some of the questions that we had, how specific they were, how broad in their scope that they were. Uh, I'd like to invite my, my other friends here. Do you guys got any parting thoughts on this, on, this, on this concept of unashamed culture, on this concept of engaging culture uh, from a Christian perspective? I have one thought, if I can just share it. Um, I just, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot and I thought that it really pertained to this. Um, I just recently did a study on first and second Thessalonians. And I think what's really cool when you read like the new Testament is how Paul really understood the culture and the context to each um, of the churches that he was writing to. And I think sometimes we're so like, like how Marcus was talking about earlier, um, the, the, we sometimes create a separation between um like what's sanctified and, and culture rather than than existing in what's going on. And it's just like this cool thing that I just um, kind of went through was on Second Thessalonians, Paul writes, for you yourselves know you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day so that we might not be uh, a burden to any of you. And I just thought that that like something that I did not learn until I was doing this study was that in Thessalonica, like there was this cultural thing where they didn't value hard work. Um, and it was like beneath them to do anything with manual labor. And I just thought it was so dope how Paul didn't come in and like lecture or condemn or be like, yo, why aren't you guys working? Like, hey, this is the way that like, there is a way that we should conduct ourselves. And don't be lazy, don't be a busybody. He like literally was like, hey, I could have come in and I had the right to ask for payment, but instead I chose to labor night and day so that you guys would have an example for what hard work looks like and an example to imitate. And so what Paul did, he didn't come in and set up like this big, he didn't argue with people and try to convince them that hard work was needed he went into the city and he found a job and he showed them night and day what this looked like. And I think he's speaking both in terms of how to earn your wages and then in terms of ministry. But I use that as an example of like, we, I think 
a, just a beautiful way to engage culture is to actually go into the spaces that we want to impact and example the way of Jesus. Uh, and that's just a parting thought that I wanted to share with everybody. That's so good. That's awesome. Well, we are right at uh, our time. Uh, we thank you guys for engaging with us. We thank you guys for going through the Bible study. Uh, this, this type of content is something that we want to do uh, more uh, to Joe, to Dee, to Ashley, to Ace. Man, I just want to thank you guys uh, for giving your time on this as well. And as always, uh, we love and appreciate you guys. We want to encourage you. Stay unashamed, right? Love God, love people. And we'll talk to you all soon. Peace. Bye, guys.